Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to a new and exciting series that we're offering entitled Towards Understanding Surah Yusuf. In this series, we will explain this beautiful and fascinating surah in the Quran which deals with the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. I am your host, Yasir Qadi. Insha'Allah ta'ala, today will be the first of a series of episodes where we talk about one of the most beautiful stories in the Quran. Stay with us. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدَى وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Verily, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. Indeed, whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can misguide Him. And whomever Allah chooses to misguide, none can guide Him back to the straight path. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity that is worthy of our worship or veneration other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is the final prophet of Allah and the most perfect worshipper. As to what follows, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to a series of episodes that we're going to do discussing the tafsir of Surah Yusuf. I am your host, Yasir Qadi. Now, as we all know, the Quran is composed of 114 surahs of varying lengths. And Surah Yusuf is one of these 114 surahs. However, it is unique in a number of ways. Firstly, the surah was revealed entirely at one go. Unlike other surahs in the Quran, for example, Surah Baqarah was revealed over, over a period of two or three years. Surah Yusuf came down all at once. Secondly, the theme of Surah Yusuf is a constant theme. It is the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. If you look at the other surahs of the Quran, many of the surahs, especially of the length of Surah Yusuf or longer than Surah Yusuf, you will find a number of themes, all of which complement one another. As for the Surah Yusuf itself, we find that the entire surah, or we can say almost the entire surah, apart from a few introductory verses and also uh, the ending verses, pretty much the entire surah deals with nothing but the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Hence, we find that this surah is in its entirety a holistic and complete surah of the Qur'an. Uh, another uh, difference about this uh, surah itself is the fact that it came at a very crucial time in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The surah was revealed towards the end of the Meccan era. Now we know that the, 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 the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam can be divided into two simple perfect divisions. The first of them is the Meccan era and the second is the Medinan era. And of course the Meccan era lasted for 13 years when he resided in Mecca and it ended with the Hijra or the emigration to Medina which then lasted for a further 10 years. Now the Meccan era saw and witnessed the revelation of the Qur'an in a certain style, in a certain manner, in a certain uh, eloquence if you like, that the Medinan era had a different one. So if you look at the surahs that were revealed in Mecca, we find a different style, a different type of wording, uh, a different type of, of, of basically rhetoric that was used and employed from the Medinan one. Both are eloquent, both are perfect, but there are different goals and different agendas to be met. In Mecca, we notice that the Meccan surahs concentrated primarily on the fundamentals of belief. They didn't go into the details of law. We don't find verses that came down about inheritance, about marriage and divorce, uh, about uh, distributing money and zakat. These commandments came down in Medina after the Prophet Muhammad wasallam had established himself and he had a full society and a state to run. As for the Meccan era, which is when Surah Yusuf came down, we find that the Meccan era concentrates pretty much entirely on the fundamentals of our theology. What do we believe about Allah? What do we believe about the prophets? What do we believe about the hereafter? And this shows us the 
importance of our theology in Islam. Theology, in Arabic we call it aqidah, is the science, is the basis of all other sciences. It is the foundation of our religion. And it is what makes a Muslim increase in his or her love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, the first foundation that we lay is the foundation of theology. And we find Surah Yusuf does not stray from this fundamental point. The entire theme of Surah Yusuf talks about the prophets and talks about the methodology of the prophets, talks about the trials and tribulations of the prophets. Hence, Surah Yusuf has a very pertinent theme to the Meccan era. It came down, as we said, towards the end of the Meccan era. And perhaps we can say, we don't know exactly when it came down. We don't know the year that, that it was revealed, but we have a rough idea. And we have an idea that it came down in the last two years of the Meccan stage. And this is very pertinent, because when we understand the situation, the context in which a revelation occurred, it helps us appreciate the surah and the verses better. In Arabic, we call this asbabun nuzul or the reasons why a surah or a verse was revealed. And this science is a very important science in understanding the Qur'an. Because when you understand the context, you understand the meaning of the verse. When you understand the situation that the verse catered to, you will be able to appreciate the, the meaning of the verse in a more profound manner. So, we need to understand the situation in Mecca in this time. The situation was basically, in, a, in, a, in one word, it was a very depressing situation. It was, out of all of the 23 years of the prophethood, if we can say that there was a low, if we can say that there was one stage, one point, that really and truly was below all of the other points, in terms of the stress, in terms of the pressures, in terms of all of the factors facing the Prophet ﷺ and the early Muslims, it would have been right before this surah was revealed, i.e. around the 10th or 11th year of the Meccan era. What happened that made the situation so tense? Why was the situation in Mecca so difficult? For a number of factors. First and foremost, the Prophet ﷺ had been preaching for over a decade in Mecca. He had been preaching for over 10 years. And instead of finding his community accept him, instead of finding his family and friends accept the message that he comes with, he finds that most of them have opposed him, especially the elite and the rich. He finds that his own close relatives, especially the tribe of Quraysh, refused to accept the teachings that he came with. And not only that, they came between him and his preaching of the message. They persecuted him, they tortured him, they killed many of his followers. They did not allow him even public access to the pilgrims. They came and they taunted him, they ridiculed him. And they did many things to try to lower his morale, to try to make sure that people did not convert to his faith. So we have a long period where we don't see the fruits of the efforts of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is feeling a, a type of despair, a type of, of why are not my people accepting me. Another reason is that a number of incidents had occurred that especially demoralized the early Muslims, that especially caused the Prophet ﷺ much grief. One of these incidents was the death of Abu Talib. And what will make you understand who Abu Talib is? Abu Talib was the one who took care of the Prophet ﷺ since he was a child. Since his mother passed away and then his grandfather, Abu Talib took charge of this orphan and Abu Talib raised him in his own household as a son. And in fact, he loved him more than he loved his own sons. Abu Talib loved the Prophet ﷺ more than he loved his own sons. And when the Prophet ﷺ began preaching his message, the Quraysh applied pressure upon his uncle to cause him to stop, to try to make him stop. Why? Not only was he the senior person in uh, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, he was also the leader of the Banu Hashim. He was the chieftain of the sub-tribe of Quraysh which the Prophet ﷺ belonged to. And it was his word that was of paramount importance. If Abu Talib had withdrawn his help from the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ would have faced a lot of opposition. So when the Quraysh applied pressure to Abu Talib, and Abu Talib never accepted Islam, until he died he did not accept Islam. When the Quraysh applied pressure to Abu Talib, initially Abu Talib caved in. And he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, you have to stop teaching this message. I cannot allow you to continue. My own people have put too much pressure on me.
And it was at that stage that the Prophet Muhammad made a very emotional appeal to his uncle. And he said, Oh my uncle, if they were to give me power over the moon and the sun, according to the Arabic, the, the precise meaning is, if they gave the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, meaning if they gave me power to control these two celestial objects which the world depends on for its sustenance by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they gave me the power to control the sun and the moon, even then I would not give up teaching this message of Islam until I die or Allah Azza wa Jal will something else. So when Abu Talib saw his zeal, when Abu Talib saw his determination, he acquiesced and agreed and he said, you may do as you please. I will never come between you and your teaching. And until the day that he died, Abu Talib gave his full support to the teachings of the Prophet wasallam, allowing him the right to propagate. He himself never accepted Islam. Why is this the case that he never accepted Islam? Because he was proud to be the son of Abdul Muttalib and Abdul Muttalib was the chieftain of the era of the time and he was so proud to be the son of this famous person that he said, I can never give up the religion of my father. I will betray my father's trust. I will betray my father's honor if I give up his religion. And so he died because he preferred his tribalism. He preferred the prestige and honor of who he was and who his father was over the religion of Islam. But Abu Talib was the primary support of the Prophet ﷺ in the physical, in the outer world. Of course, Allah Azza wa Jal is the only support in the real sense. But of course Allah Azza wa Jal uses people. And of the people that he used was the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib. And Abu Talib as we said was the primary person in the entire city of Mecca who allowed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the freedom to preach and practice. Had Abu Talib withdrawn that right, then if anybody had harmed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he was basically without a protector. But because Abu Talib had that right, because Abu Talib gave him that right, nobody could harm the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without getting the wrath of Abu Talib and behind that the weight of the entire tribe of Banu Hashim. This was like what we call in our times a passport. Imagine if your country withdraws your passport from you. You have no country to support you when you're traveling. You have no entity to go back to. Similarly, in the Jahili society of the Prophet ﷺ, a passport was what the chieftain gave you. The chieftain said you're a part of the tribe. And if you're a part of the tribe, the tribe has to support you. Hence, Abu Talib gave the support of the tribe of Banu Hashim to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Had he withdrawn it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not have had any support in Mecca. Abu Talib passed away in the 10th year of the Hijrah and at the death of Abu Talib, much agitation occurred, much problems began and that was the first of many incidents that led to the revelation of the Surah Yusuf. Stay with us, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about the context in which Surah Yusuf was revealed. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. قد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. We were discussing the context in which Surah Yusuf was revealed. And we said that a number of incidents had happened which caused great distress to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first of these was the death of his uncle Abu Talib. Now as we said, Abu Talib was the primary political protector of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was also a father figure. He was of course his father's brother. He was his father's full brother, unlike some of the other uncles. For example, Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was a half-brother. And Abu Lahab was the worst enemy of the Prophet wasallam. unlike Abu Talib. Abu Talib was a full brother and he was a political supporter, not a religious supporter. So Abu Talib did his best to allow the Prophet wasallam the security that he needed to preach in Mecca. When Abu Talib died, and he died around the 10th year of the Meccan stage of da'wah, 10th year of the, we don't call it hijrah because obviously the hijrah occurred afterwards, the 10th year of the prophetic call, i.e. three years before the hijrah. This allowed the Quraysh and the Arabs opportunity to be more bold 
against the Prophet Sallallahu to ridicule him more and in fact it was only a matter of time just a, literally a matter of time, few years, two, three years after the death of Abu Talib, where the situation became so bad that the Prophet ﷺ was forced to flee with his very life. They, they plotted to assassinate him, they plotted to kill him, and they would never have had the audacity to do that when Abu Talib was alive. So the death of Abu Talib allowed the Meccans allowed the pagans to increase in their hostility and to come more and more in the face of the Prophet ﷺ to prevent him teaching the message. So the death of Abu Talib was firstly a personal loss. In other words, this was his father figure, this was his uncle, this was somebody he looked up to and revered, and it was also a political loss. In the sense that Abu Talib gave him the political protectorship. Now, just as a side point here, the, the, the death of Abu Talib is recorded in the books of history that when he was dying on his very last day of, of life, the Prophet ﷺ came and he begged him, he pleaded with him to try to accept Islam. And he said, oh my dear uncle, all I ask is that you say one phrase, one statement, one kalima that I will be able to argue on your behalf in front of Allah. Give me this one kalima and I will be able to argue your case in front of Allah, that kalima is la ilaha illallah. Just say this, and I will be able to plead your case in front of Allah. If you don't say it, then basically I cannot plead. And Abu Talib was so close to saying it, but he had sitting there some of the leaders of Quraysh, some of the pagan elders, of them Abu Lahab, and of them uh, Abu Jahl, and all of these evil leaders of Quraysh, and they said, O oh Abu Talib, are you going to give up the religion of your father, Abdul Muttalib? And Abdul Muttalib was that person. He had that personality. He had that respect amongst all of the Arabs that Abu Talib could not give up the religion of his own father. So he died saying that I am upon the religion of my father and that was the religion of uh, paganism, the religion of shirk. So Abu Talib did not die in the state of Islam. So this was a personal loss and it grieved the Prophet ﷺ greatly. The, the famous historian of the seerah by the name of Ibn Ishaq, the most authoritative book of seerah was written by Ibn Ishaq in 150 Hijrah. Ibn Ishaq said, after the death of Abu Talib, the Quraysh were able to harm the Prophet ﷺ like they had never harmed him before. So it was a very personal loss. The second incident that occurred was even more personal. And that was the death of none other than his wife Khadija. And who will make you understand what the status of Khadija is? Khadija. Khadija, this woman who gave up everything that she owned to support the Prophet ﷺ. Khadija, this noble lady, this first wife of the Prophet ﷺ, whom he remained married to over 25 years, he remained married to Khadija. And he never took another wife when he was married to Khadija. Khadija was his personal comfort, his solace, his support. As Abu Talib was his political protector outside, Khadija was the one whom he would turn to as a man turns to his wife for comfort, for support. As every single person knows, spouses help one another. When you're in crisis, when you're in grief, you turn to your spouse and you confide in them and your spouse uplifts your spirit. Your wife, if you're, uh, you, your wife or your husband, your spouse will lift your spirit up, will calm you down, will guide you in the right direction. And not only that, Khadija also supported the Prophet ﷺ financially. Khadija was a very rich lady and she was the one who wanted to marry the Prophet ﷺ and she sent the messages through uh, other people that she was interested in the Prophet ﷺ and when the marriage took place it was Khadija who offered her money to the Prophet ﷺ so that he was free to teach and preach and had it not been for that money he would have been busy earning his income he would not have had the time to preach to the people so Khadija helped him in every way that she could. And many years later, when uh, the Prophet ﷺ married other women, and of them was Aisha, his beloved wife. Aisha, she says, I never saw Khadija. She was too young. Khadija died before Aisha saw her. She said, I never saw Khadija. And yet I was never as jealous of any of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ as I was of Khadija because of the status that Khadija had in the wife of the in the in the, in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. The status that Khadija had as the first wife and as the wife that he was married to for so many years, even Aisha felt it many years later. And she said, even though I never saw her, I was so jealous of her. The Prophet ﷺ in Medina, many years later, when he would get any gift. 
He would send it to the sister of Khadija. He would send it to the cousins of Khadija. He would send it to the neighbors of Khadija. And this would infuriate Aisha. And she would say, why are you sending it to a woman who has passed away and gone? And she was an old lady. And Allah has blessed you with a much better and a younger lady. And the Prophet ﷺ, he became irritated at this. And he said, no, by Allah, Allah has not blessed me with a woman better than her. In other words, no woman is better than her. By Allah, Allah has not blessed me with a woman better than her. She believed in me when everybody else rejected me. She supported me when everybody else turned away from me. And she gave me money when everybody else refused to help me. Khadija, and also the Prophet said she gave me children when no other woman has given, has given me children. Allah Azza wa Jal blessed that, the, the, the children of the Prophet Sallallahu except for Ibrahim, the other children of the Prophet all came from Khadija. So Khadija has a status that no other woman has. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Many are the men who have perfected their iman, but only four are the women who have perfected their iman. Many are the men who have perfected their iman, but only four women have ever perfected their iman. And he said first and foremost was Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. And then it was Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. And the third he said Khadija. Khadija, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the fourth Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are the four women who have perfected Iman. Khadija, Khadija was the lady when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first received the revelation, when he first saw this angel hovering in the air and hugging him tightly until he thought he would die, when he was confused, when he was distressed, when he was distraught, when he had no one else to turn to on this earth. He comes rushing down the mountain and whose house does he go to? Who does he turn to? Abu Talib? Abu Bakr? No. He goes running home to the, wife, to the house of his wife Khadija. He goes running home to Khadija and he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up. And so Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha covers him up and consoles him. And when she hears what has happened, she says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, ma yukhzik Allahu abada. Allah will never humiliate you. Allah will never cause you distress. You are good to the orphans. You take care of the poor. You help your relatives. You are a righteous man. Allah will not cause you to go into something that is problematic. Allah will not curse you. Allah Azza wa will not cause you any distress or harm. And she was the one who took him to her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. So from the beginning, we see the role and status of Khadija, that Khadija consoles the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She is his primary source of support. And this is something every single man knows, that you need to have a household that is running, that is comforting. You need to have a wife who is supportive. If your wife is not supportive, no matter what you do in the world around you, when your household itself is not correct, when your inside of your, of your, of your house is in chaos, then the outside also will be in chaos. You need that peace and harmony that only a wife and only a loving woman can provide. And this was Khadija that provided this support to the Prophet Sallallahu Lo and behold, she passed away six weeks after the death of Abu Talib. It was a double blow, one after the other. Right after his uncle, his father figure dies. Immediately six weeks after that, he has barely recovered from this loss. And an even more profound loss happens. An even more profound loss occurs. And that is the loss of the mother of his children. The loss of his dear and beloved wife. The loss of Khadija binti Khuwailid. And there was yet another instance that would happen. Yet another problem and tragedy that would occur. And that would be even more demoralizing, as if it was even possible, but even more demoralizing than the previous two. And that was the rejection that the Prophet ﷺ faced in the city of at taif After the death of Abu Talib and Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ decided to undertake a journey to a new city. He had been preaching in Mecca for 10 years and he had given up hope of the people accepting Islam in Mecca. He had tried everything. He had persisted. He had gone through every single legitimate tactic that he could think of. He had prayed and implored them, but they continued to be stubborn. They continued to be mocking and ridiculing and sarcastic. And so he decided to try to find another city. He decided to go and try the city of at taif and the city of At-Ta'if was the neighboring city of Mecca. It was the closest city to Mecca. It was also a very old and prestigious city, just like the city of Mecca was as well. And the tribe of Ta'if was known as Thaqif. And the tribe of Quraysh, of, uh, the tribe of Mecca, of course, was Quraysh. And the Quraysh and the Thaqif, they considered themselves to be rivals. 
They consider themselves both to be of noble, if you like, pedigree. They consider themselves to be worthy opponents. And so the Prophet ﷺ set forth, and this happened again, as we said, after the incidents of the death of, uh, uh, of Abu Talib and Khadija. The Prophet ﷺ set forth to see if the city of Ta'if would be any uh, better in terms of recruits, any better in terms of people converting to Islam. And so he journeyed his way up all the way to the city of Ta'if. And the city of Ta'if is at the top of a mountain. And he journeyed his way alone, or maybe he was with uh, his slave Bilal. There are reports that mention that there was maybe Bilal with him, but he was not with any other support. And there he faced a bitter and cruel rejection. A rejection that when we understand it, once again it contextualizes the point of revealing Surah Yusuf. To summarize before we conclude for today, when we understand the context of Revelation, when we understand when Surah Yusuf came down, we will better appreciate the contents of the Surah. And in this class we discussed, in this episode we discussed that Surah Yusuf was revealed after a long period of da'wah had not been successful, after the relatives of the Prophet and his cousins had opposed him, and then the deaths of two very dear people, Abu Talib and Khadija, happened one after the other, and there was a third incident to occur, and that shall be the beginning of our next episode. I hope to see you then. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب ما كان حديثا يفترى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون